Our guest in this segment is Dr. Stephen Goldman. He joins us via telephone and uh, at uh, Shepherd University on Wednesday this week. He'll be doing a brown bag lecture entitled Brevet Lieutenant Colonel Joseph Wiley Gelray, How a Maimed Union Veteran Battled the Ku Klux Klan. It is uh, available to you at the Robert C. Byrd Center for Congressional History and Education Auditorium. It's free and open to the public. Again, that's Wednesday at noon. Dr. Goldman, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Good morning. I understand that uh, Bill Stumblefield tells me that he has met you already over at Shepherd University, Bill. Yeah, I believe we've uh, met a couple of so social functions, Doctor. Yeah, and also I believe the term you were looking for, Evan, was terminate with extreme prejudice. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the party. <laughs> you know, if you have a method in mind, doctor, be sure and submit it. <laughs> this interview just got a lot more dangerous for me. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask you about the subject of this lecture and the book uh, as well. One more war to fight union veterans battle for equality through reconstruction, Jim Crow and uh, the lost cause too because you're you're getting into territory which is fascinating but i haven't seen tackled before can you tell me how you came about this um i appreciate that and by the way i'm not i'm doing well on amazon i'm not number two on the list so i do want to point that out <laughs> after this interview you're gonna be number one baby <laughs> yeah i mean this is great um let me give you a real quick um summary of my background i mean i uh, Psychiatrists who's worked with both treated and worked with veterans for decades, and it's been one of the highlights of my career. And um, this is my first book. Um, I have two others that are already completed in a planned trilogy, but in typical publishing um, style, this is actually the second book that was supposed to come out is now the first book, so the next one will be the prequel. Um, it's a story, it's actually two stories that have not been told before. One of them is the fascinating and extremely important story of how um, Union veterans, black and white, fought a second war after they had survived the Civil War, the battle for equality for all Americans over the next 50 years. And intertwined with that story is an equally compelling and equally important story is how they established the model, the paradigm, for civic responsibility of American veterans that followed in the years to come. And you know, two great examples of that are when the uh, under Truman's order, executive order desegregating the army, the military after World War II, the tremendous changes that took place not just in the military but in American society, and groups like the Vietnam Veterans Against the War which was one of the major um, factors that led to essentially um, the popular resistance to the war being done through uh, men and women who had served there, with John Kerry being uh, one of the leaders of that. And those of us who were around at the time certainly remember his amazing testimony in 1971. So there are two stories here. And they're intertwined. And again, I try and what I always do with history, um, history matters about the present and the future, because the only way you'll do that is by knowing where you've come from. And so I'm thrilled to have a chance to tell these two stories uh, based also on my um, experience with uh, veterans active duty personnel throughout my career. Let's go author to author here with John Gilstrap, John. So the study, of essentially, of just reading the reviews, I apologize, I have not read the book. Um, you, as I understand, there's you went through almost a psychological analysis of of unpublished letters from soldiers in order to to put this the story together. Is that right? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, no. Um, it's it is clearly based on my working with veterans, but. It's what, what it started out with, I use both a representative cohort of severely wounded Union veterans who were asked to submit a handwriting sample uh, right after the war had ended in order to enable them to learn how to use their left hands. Those handwriting samples turned out to be 
268 of the most amazing essays that exist on men, combat veterans, most of them decorated or equivalent decorated combat veterans at a time when war was ending. So this is contemporaneous material. I then use that representative cohort called the Left Arm Corps to look at all Union veterans, which I do, to take a look about what happened after they returned. So again, the story here is using my experience as to what happens when men and women return from military service, return from war. And as you know, um, the image of veterans in the popular media continues to be at variance with what actually happens when veterans return. And this book is a, is a manifestation of that, that the, the great majority of men and women who do return after an initial period of adjustment do very well in civilian life, uh, particularly when you fought or served in a conflict that has tremendous implications for the society to which you return. And there's no greater example of that than the Civil War. So yes, there were, psych there were psychological and psychiatric elements here, but this is not a story about PTSD. This is a story about the warrior identity. So this tie the story about I'm sorry. Go ahead. So tie this into the elements of Reconstruction and Jim Crow. Was this? Did you find this to be a, a a common thread through these hundreds of writing samples, or how did? Where does that nexus come? Okay. Well, first of all, the, these essays were submitted in 1865, early 1866. So Reconstruction was just starting. Again, they were asked for a handwriting sample, and yet what is what is crystal clear is that these were, by the way. 98% enlisted men. This was a national cohort, almost predominantly white. It's, it's a cohort that just doesn't exist in any other format. And their, their clear, tremendous interest in continuing the causes for which they fought. And of course, the two causes for which they fought initially to maintain the Republic, but it, starting with the um, release of the Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, uh, liberation of African Americans, destruction of slavery became at least as important a war aim. But that wasn't enough. When Lincoln talked about um, the unfinished work at the Gettysburg Address, the unfinished work was a quality. Nobody knew that better than the men who had served in the armies and navies of the Union. And the story I tell here is a story which, by the way, is contradictory to what's been the accepted historical uh, viewpoint that Union soldiers were indifferent to Reconstruction, were indifferent to this, I found exactly the opposite. Now, that did not come from the essays. That came from the next 50 years of examining contemporaneous newspapers, what these men and others did in their lives, um, the politicians who entered political life who were Union veterans, disproportionately Union veterans, and the tremendous importance of the most influential single war veterans organization that has ever existed in the United States, the Grand Army of the Republic, which was driven by the rank and file. So again, there, there are elements that coalesce here, but it's, it's and again, you've got a, a great detective writer uh, here. I'm a great fan of detective fiction. This is narrative nonfiction. This, these, this is a story. There's a, there are two narratives here. And one of them is the warrior identity that compelled these men to fight for what they fought during the war in peacetime. And again, the second aspect is they made good the fact they had survived. And that is, again, a story we hear over and over. One of the great examples, again, John Kerry's book, uh, entitled Every Day is Extra. And he talks about the fact he survived the war meant that he had to find a way, as so many other veterans do, to utilize the gift of survival to change their society when they return home. So this is not just a story from the 19th century. This is a story for the 21st century. Sure, I'm, uh, I'm intrigued by the ideological commitment that these soldiers had to make the world better. Uh, this commitment, uh, do you have any sense at all if it was they had this before they went into the war or something they they garnered or gathered during the war? That's a great question. War 
and particularly service in, in a war that is ideologically based, uh, is radicalizing. There is no doubt that the Union soldier, black and white, in high proportion, were radicalized by their experiences. And again, you've got to remember this: three separate categories of Union veterans. There's white Northern veterans, who may have been the most radicalized of all. Because when the war started, uh, as in Jim McPherson's book um, um, that he did, he looked at the fact that most of the Union soldiers who enlisted in 1861 were Democrats. Well, as we know, by 1864, they voted overwhelmingly for a Republican, uh, Abraham Lincoln. Their political views had changed. Then you had a second category of, of Union veteran. Those were free men of color who were not fighting – for their freedom because they were free, but they were second-class citizens almost exclusively in the border states and in the northern states. They were fighting for equal rights as citizens. Then you had a third category, about two-thirds of African-American soldiers who fought in the Civil War and the armies of the Union were men who had been formerly enslaved. So they were literally fighting for their own freedom and for the freedom of the four million others who were enslaved. So you can imagine, you can't imagine more compelling evidence of how as as combat does as war experience does was life altering and as as i was as i were as you were when i found their ideological commitment which again was antithetical to much of the teaching previously it, it just it, it it was there and that's why i use contemporaneous newspapers that's why i followed these men throughout the, the rest of their lives by the way the last men died in 1937 of this cohort um, that's why the book covers 50 years. It goes from 1866 to 1913. And whereas most books about Reconstruction end with Reconstruction 1876, in some ways my book is just getting started because I look at what happened after Reconstruction, after I delve into what happened during Reconstruction. If there had not been a Reconstruction, and Reconstruction started off with a lot of energy and died out after 15 years or so, uh, if it had not been a Reconstruction, do you think that your the story that you're uh, uh, you're telling would have ever come about? It's unthinkable there would have been a Reconstruction. There had to be Reconstruction, and the you know Abraham Lincoln's death gave even greater impotence for the men who had served unto him, can continue the work that he had talked about, the unfinished work. And, you know, Lincoln's barely mentioned in this book because he, he was dead by April 1865. These men carried on that legacy. I think Abraham Lincoln would be tremendously proud of what were called thinking bayonets. And there, were no, there was no greater manifestation of the term thinking bayonets than the men of the Union. And the way that they stuck together, and again, let me point this out. The Grand Army of the Republic was the only national organization of its prestige and size that refused to draw a color line. And one of the, frankly, one of the most compelling chapters in the book is the 1891 showdown at the national meeting of the Grand Army where they refused to draw a color line in any state in the Union that had – um, Grand Army Post. That was five years before Placey versus Ferguson established Jim Crow as the law of the land and set back civil rights for, for decades. So this, these are, again, Reconstruction had to be done. Now, Reconstruction ended. In many ways, it failed. But in, in frankly, unacknowledged ways, Reconstruction didn't fail because so many of the things that occurred were under federal law. The 14th Amendment remains the law under which people have equal rights under the law. That was during Reconstruction. The Civil Rights Acts, which were later struck down, but they were there. The Ku Klux Klan Acts, the Enforcement Acts, those are federal law. And what happened during Reconstruction enforced the primacy of the federal government to protect the right to vote, to protect other rights that people had. None of that had taken place before Reconstruction. In Ku Klux Klan, uh, it's uh, early days, it was more of an economic issue and found great support uh, in several states, including Oregon and Ohio and the like. Uh, 
later it became uh, uh, lost economic uh, impact and started becoming more uh, social, uh, racially driven. Uh, did the uh, did the uh, the subjects of your book respond in kind during this era? Did they were they supportive at one time of Ku Klux Klan, or do you have any idea of uh, the uh, the sense of involvement? Northern soldiers. Yeah. They adamantly opposed the Klan. Even in its early days, before the Klan became identified as a tool for for racial discrimination. Uh, the Klan was always a tool for racial discrimination. Okay. And, um, again, the talk I'm going to give on Wednesday is about one particular Union soldier, a remarkable man, uh, Joseph Wilder Gelray, who had lost an arm at uh, Gettysburg and stayed in, stayed in the regular army, and he became the lead investigator of the Klan in Tennessee. That was the lair of Nathan Bedford Forrest, the Grand Wizard himself. And what Gelray wrote and what he did sounded exactly like what happened in the 1960s during uh, the Johnson administration, where the bill finally came due at 100 years after Reconstruction. The legislation of the Great Society was very similar to the legislation of Reconstruction. But in this time, in the 60s, the government stayed the course. And so, again, there's so many links here. And with the Klan, what I talk about in particular was the first version of the Klan, the one that the first Grant administration essentially destroyed with the Ku Klux Klan Act, with the right to spend a habeas corpus, with the commitment of the government to that. But the um, motivations for the Klan, the racial hatred, white supremacy, that existed didn't go away certainly and when reconstruction ended when they pulled the army out in 1876 well we know what happened after that and again jim crow wasn't just in the south it was also in the north and as you point out the sec the other versions of the clan involved the north in states like oregon indiana new jersey and other places but that was a that was not the Reconstruction version of the Klan. That came later. The Emancipation Proclamation uh, famously freed slaves in the Confederacy. The wording of the proclamation does not affect or refer to slaves in the United States, in the North. When were those slaves freed officially? Okay. That's a great question. Um, don't forget, that was a war measure. And the reason why Lincoln was so... Um, fervent about getting a 13th Amendment, he knew that the Emancipation Proclamation would not stand once the war was over. That's why the 13th Amendment had to be ratified. I'm very proud as a Maryland resident now to point out that Maryland, a border state, a slave state, um, had its own emancipation when they changed the Constitution in the state of Maryland before the ratification. And, w uh, and when was that? The 1864. 1864 was the 13th Amendment? Yeah, uh, well, the ratification, this, the ratification was the end of that. But before that, Maryland I see. itself banned slavery, emancipated all um, people held in, in slavery in Maryland, which, by the way, ha over half the African Americans in Maryland in the 1860 census were free people. They were not enslaved. You know, it's a fascinating history here. The point that I'm making is that um, the Emancipation Proclamation only – you're absolutely right. It only applied to the states in rebellion. It also did not include border states, loyal border states, uh, such as Maryland. And um, that was a compromise that they did. But what the Emancipation Proclamation did, even in areas it did not technically apply to, it gave the war – a different level of commitment to something that was even greater than uh, maintenance of the republic. It made the republic worth saving because if Lincoln had lost the election of 1864, George McClellan ran on a platform that would have led to – they were agreeing to a peace agreement with the Confederacy. It's entirely possible the Confederacy would have left the Union and slave and the Emancipation Proclamation would have had no, no force, no binding force. And as 
could stars like Gary Gallagher and others have pointed out, without the Union Army, the Emancipation Proclamation could not have been enforced. That's why it's so important to tie these ideas together, because it was the men of the Union who we who we enlisted in tremendous numbers in 1864 and who voted for Abraham Lincoln in 1864 on a platform of the 13th Amendment being ratified and the war being continued until slavery was destroyed and African Americans being brought into the armies. These were radical ideas that no one would have conceived in 1860. By 1864, all these things were in place. Dr. Stephen Goldman is our guest here on the program on Wednesday of this week at noon. He'll be at the Robert C. Byrd Center for Congressional History and Education in the auditorium. It is free and open to the public as he gives his talk at the uh, George Tyler Moore Center for the Study of Civil uh, Civil War. And I want to hear a bit more, if we could take a couple minutes uh, to talk about uh, Colonel Joseph Wiley, Lieutenant Colonel Joseph Wiley Gelray. We haven't gotten into his story too much during the course of this discussion. Can you tell me where you will be uh, concentrating and, and what kind of things you'll be highlighting during your speech on Wednesday? Uh, yeah, boy, you know, I can write a separate book about Gelray. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he's just remarkable. So also, there's a wonderful picture in my book of him. Um, he was a printer. He, he, came from, he came from England. He enlisted as a private, later became uh, a brevet lieutenant colonel, and um, he became the lead investigator for the Klan of the Freedmen's Bureau. And so what I'm going to talk about is the Freedmen's Bureau, a, a remarkable organization, strictly military organization, let me point out. And I will be reading excerpts from his, his reports on the Klan, and they will make your hair stand on end. They're terrifying, but they're important. Because if we're going to deal with our history, we have to deal with all the history. And he, he details his investigations. He'll detail how the Klan terrorized legitimate authority. Um, they basically ran rampant throughout the former Confederate states. The Army only had limited authority because they'd already fought a civil war. And they never really unleashed the Army in the Confederate states because it would have restarted the war, quite frankly. And those are the things I will go over, but I'll also point out something which remains very important. There were men and women of that time who fought racism, who fought against um, maltreatment of our, federal, of our fellow citizens, who strove mightily to educate the newly free people. And the, and the free people of color, African Americans themselves, were remarkable. Particularly, the black Union veterans became leaders in their community. They became some of the strongest proponents of civil rights. So, I mean, this is this is a large story, and Gelray was was a major part of that because of what he tried to do. And it's also a tragic story because ultimately he did not succeed. They couldn't stop what was going on in the South. Because Reconstruction did fail. And even though they may have defeated the first version of the Klan, they could not defeat uh, the weariness in the North, which is part of the reason why Reconstruction failed, uh, the limitations of what they could do in the individual states, and the fact that Jim Crow marched on, and I'm talking about North and South, so that... Um, there's a there's a big story here, a big picture here that still has impact today. It is not lost on uh, many that this is at the Robert C. Byrd Center. Byrd, of course, a former Klansman himself. Is that an inconvenient yes. coincidence, or is it purposeful that it is in this specific location? Uh, it's a great facility where I've spoken before, <laughs> um, but you know that's a that's a great point and. Um, you know, it's an interesting question because of, you know, this this comes up a lot. I get, I get asked a lot of these questions about about the Klan, and um, I remember when I first moved to Indiana, when I, I joined the medical center there. Nobody would talk about the Klan in Indiana, and yet I had a friend who was from Northern Indiana, another psychiatrist, and he was he was a tremendous resource for me. 
because his dad had fought the Klan in northern Indiana. John Wooden fought the Klan in southern Indiana. Mm-hmm. And now the story about the Klan in Indiana is nationally known because of the books written about it. There's a brand new book about uh, Stevenson, who was the Grand Wizard in Indiana. There's a terrific TV movie uh, about that. Now the story's told. But for decades, nobody wanted to talk about it. And that was in a northern state, not a southern state. And now, of course, we have um, plays and movies about uh, what happened in Atlanta, the lynching of um, uh, Leo Frank, a Jewish man in Indiana who was lynched. Oh, and in Atlanta was lynched. There is now a museum on lynching. Um, so again, in my book, I have a fair amount of material devoted to the perhaps the greatest fighter against lynching, Ida B. Wells Barnett, who was a remarkable woman. Um, so all these stories that I have in the book are all part of the the tapestry of this. And it's done not just to show the horror, but to show that there were people of faith and belief in the 19th century, early 20th century, who did everything they could to oppose this. And um, like in any science, like in, in, in medicine, you stand on the shoulders of the people who come before you. And there are, a lot of these, there are a lot of these people in the book who explain how we've gotten to where we are now, how far we've come and how far we have to go. But there was, we didn't start this. There were other people who started this way before we did. And a big part of that, frankly, were the men of the Union, black and white. It was on this date, 1955, Emmett Till was lynched. Yeah, that's right. Uh, 1957, same date, Senator Strom Thurmond begins a, a filibuster pr- to prevent the Senate from voting on the Civil Rights Act of 1957. So uh, this date, uh, this week, in, indeed, uh, historical in nature when it comes to this sort of thing. And Wednesday at noon, you'll be at Shepherd University. If uh, folks can't make it this Wednesday, you were telling me yesterday you're going to be in Frederick very soon. Yeah, I've got a whole host of events I'll be doing. Um, and again, the book, you can take a look at it on Amazon. It's in libraries. Um, I'll be doing a lot of things locally. Uh, yeah, I'll be uh, at the Frederick Library or October. I'm also doing events in Rockville. Uh, I, try and, I try and do different talks from the book at each venue in case people come to more than one. And um, there are just a lot of stories here. And it's a thrill to be able to tell these stories um, both not the, just not the university, but also across the region and now nationally. And the thing about Civil War, the thing about writing about veterans, it, you always find new material. It's just incredible the resources we now have, and particularly the online newspapers, like the, the Chronicling America, which is done through the Library of Congress and a great website from upstate New York. These newspapers are remarkable. It's just a, a wonderful source, and now they're available online. And books on Google has tremendous material, all in the public domain. It's made research so much easier because of the availability of these tremendous data sources. Um, so we currently have advantages over the great historians who preceded us because the material is easy to get to, and a lot of it's more accessible. Dr. Goldman, thanks so much for joining us today. It has been my pleasure. Dr. Stephen Goldman, great to talk with you. Thank you, doctor.